I am. Okay. Hi. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I'm Radhika Rangarajan. I'm a program manager in Intel's Big Data Technologies team in Intel Software. Uh, Monica here is a PE and uh, director of data science uh, from the data center group. Together, we're going to tag team and present to you a few use, use cases we have enabled on real-time analytics through our open source contributions. Uh, but before we get into the actual use cases, I want to give some context to what Intel is doing in big data space. We always get asked this question, hardware company, seriously software? So let's just address the big elephant in the room and then move on. Um, I won't spend too much time on it though, so I promise. All right, you can't have any big data speech without giving this data, so I'm going to point this anyway. Uh, big data is a huge opportunity for enterprises. It obviously allows companies to derive insights from various data sources coming into the cloud from mobile devices or IoT devices or any other data sources that these business models have. For the rest of this conversation today, I'm going to refer to big data analytics as BDA. So stick with me on that. It's just too big, uh, too long for me to say that. Uh, there is enough evidence to show that big data analytics, BDA investments, actually have huge payoffs. Uh, here is some research from Bain. Um, obviously, uh, the insights that you derive from the data is what's going to differentiate you from your competition. So while, it, while everyone might assume that it's a source of competitive advantage, well, it's not any kind of data they will want to analyze. What's the right kind of data? But companies who are investing well on this um, seem to be making faster, smarter decisions, uh, more data-driven decisions, and obviously that positions them financially really well. All right. So what's Intel doing in big data? Uh, I'm not gonna dwell too much on this because I'm sure you've seen some flavor of this somewhere, but I will briefly state that Intel is actually trying to catalyze an industry transformation by enabling and optimizing standardized building blocks at this infrastructure level, uh, the compute storage and network. The work that we do in optimizing with connected network, storage, orchestration, virtualization, including our OpenStack efforts is something that everyone is familiar with. But we have a role to play in this entire stack, uh, and that's before as well as together with our Cloudera collaboration. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that here. At the data platform, we believe that Hadoop is uh, the future operating system of the data center. Uh, we are continuing to invest our efforts, both in optimizing adding security features, not just to Apache Hadoop, but Apache Spark. Uh, if you've paid close attention to the big data stack, you will see that Spark has been the front runner in the big data ecosystem. So we have a lot of innovative work happening in both Hadoop and Spark, uh, but the real value is not exactly in the infrastructure or even in the data platform. Ultimately, businesses derive, need to derive value for, from all this data. If you look at the what's the barrier to entry for a lot of companies that are trying to get into the big data space, it's just one thing. We don't know what business value we think we'll get out of this investment. So we want to actually make this mainstream. So we want to drive mainstream use of advanced analytics. And I will say this later on in the conversation with our uh, use cases, we're going to share specific analytics building blocks that we are developing and contributing to open source ecosystem. So there's plenty of exciting projects that we have going on in that space. Ultimately, all of this, you can do all of this, and still if you don't offer some kind of a cookbook or a recipe, you're still not making the camp big enough for a lot of players to come in and actually start experimenting with this. So we have a lot of lighthouse solutions. What you're gonna hear today is three such lighthouse solutions uh, that we have enabled. Uh, think of these as recipes. Uh, it's not going to fit exactly your use case, but it's going to help you give a better picture, a better context, and extend what we have done to what you might do in your domain. All right, so that's Intel's take on big data strategy. We have a power play through the entire stack. Uh, I want to take a moment to mention what open source is and why open source matters. Intel's commitment to open source ecosystem goes 20 years ago. Um, and open source was what started as just an idea has actually pretty much revolutionized how software is being developed today. Open source is not just something that developers and enterprises use, it's something that's all around us. 
if you are actually googling something if you are trying to post something on facebook if you are browsing something if you are watching a video somewhere if you are driving somewhere and you're using driver data set you are using open source almost a billion phones today in the world are using open source software and that includes your windows phones and your iphones so my point here is it's all about open source and if history can tell us something and i'll tell you this at intel we're pretty serious about our history lessons we have learned that custom hardware running proprietary software isn't going to scale we know that standard based hardware running open source software is what's going to open up the field of expansive computing um, we take our history lessons to heart so i want to just show you very quickly what we are doing in terms of our open source commitment at intel um, and this is this is more of an anecdotal uh, point here that for those of you who don't know what intel's and open source marriage looks like well this is what it is a uh, lot of times we are attributed to our linux open source contributions we are number one in our linux open source and dial it down to big data space we are the number four contributor in apache hadoop we are the number three contributor in apache spark because we so truly believe that open source pretty much you deliver you develop something put it in open source you are now enabling a massive number of people to actually take advantage of what you built and start developing new stuff a hardware company has over 10,000 maybe even 20,000 software engineers um, i've spent 15 years at intel i've always worked in intel software um, be it manufacturing automation or it automation or product engineering so just some perspective that we realize that hardware is just a medium to deliver experiences to you and to me because it's all about the consumer it's all about the user experience so hardware as a medium for software is what matters so we have a quite a lot of exciting projects that we've been working on for the last 20 years and those are those are the kind of projects that do the behind the scenes work for you it's beyond optimization it's beyond the uh, security features uh, some of them are actually even high level language api that you think was just available for you somewhere but was intel developed um, so that's our open source marriage uh, here um, let's take it back to our topic hadoop open source ecosystem and i'm sure this picture and this stack has changed even as i'm speaking so i'm not going to bother about correcting all of that but what i'm trying to make a point at is we have our footprint all over the space in the apache big data stack so you want to understand what our contribution is in each of these um, you can go to the open source community and check it out come to bigdata.intel.com we have some uh, once it is once it gets merged into the main chunk you can obviously get it from the apache projects but there's a lot of innovative cool stuff where we actually use our internal site as landing zones um, and we'll be very happy to point you all to those uh, um, projects the whole point with this is uh, we continue to build the thought leadership in open source community uh, we have some exciting building blocks in real time and advanced big data analytics and i cannot state this enough obviously it's all about the business at the end of the day why does intel want to do this if there is something that computes out there it better compute well on intel architecture so that's that's our reason for actually spending so much effort on um, software enabling I'm going to pass it on to Monica because she's going to give us some basics on what real-time analytics is, and then uh, we'll go over a few use cases. Thank you, Radhika. Okay, so just to level set, usually when we talk about analytics, I go back to culture and companies and talk about the different levers. Um, just uh, to level set in the room, how many of you guys work for big companies? How many of you work for um, medium-sized companies? How about startups? Okay. So for that reason alone, I am not going to spend any time talking about different levers at the C-suite that a company pulls in order to make um, analytics and monetization and capture of analytics um, actually happen, because it's going to be very unique to your individual company. But I will talk about uh, very quickly um, the data, data coming from sensors and how you extract uh, value out of that. So in the literature and in all the blogs and in <laughs> just about any marketing um, uh, 
paper that is released, you always hear about the top three uh, data characterizations, volume, variety, and velocity. But in fact, it's actually much more complex than that. There's at least seven um, different types of data characterizations. And we actually have to be able to pull out different levels of um, value from, from that data. Um, and if we use Gartner's um, analytic levels, the descriptive, what's happening, the diagnostic, why is that happening, the predictive, what will happen, the prescriptive, um, what should be happening, and then a new one that's emerging uh, for various reasons, the personalized analytics, the what should be happening to you or to your device. Um, it's very much about being able to extract value at various levels and being able to monetize that or actuate um, another level of activity. So what is real-time analytics within that context? Well, it really is about your ability to process data, data coming from your devices in the present, today, while you're still breathing and leaving, and leaving here on Earth, um, or as my grad, graduate advisor used to say, we, you know, back then when we were uh, first working on some of Intel's story and supercomputing on the Intel Paragon, uh, we always used to uh, joke about living to see the answer because it just took so long to actually run any analytics um, or simulation on any of your data workloads. So when we talk about real-time analytics, we're talking about the present, and that's gonna make it very relative to you. Um, as opposed to storing and retrieving it for the future, for future batch analysis or other um, retrospective efforts. So in fact, it's gonna be about the ability to make better decisions and take meaningful actions at the right time. And that right time can vary. So, how real is real time? Is the million dollar question, right? Um, so, um, in one of my various roles, I'm a data scientist, I'm a mathematician, I'm a statistician, I, I'm a scientist, I worry about um, extracting value out of the science that we do at a big company. So I spend a lot of time, and most of you would agree that 80% of your time is gonna, is gonna be on the far left, data distillation, um, where you're doing a lot of data wrangling. Um, then you're gonna spend some fun time on model development. Um, after you've finished either validating your data or validating your model or validating your infrastructure and the various types of validations that you have to do in order to actually uh, deploy this so, don't you, so you don't break your infrastructure. And God forbid you bring down your company's entire infrastructure because then you'll have CEOs and a couple of other people knocking at your cubicle. Um, then finally, you get to do something called real-time scoring, right, where you get real-time recommendation. And usually when you do these releases, you, you find out very quickly that you have to do some sort of model research of some sort. Okay, so again, this, goes, this begs the question, how real is real time? There's no such thing as real time. There's only near real time. If you're working um, like I used to do, I, I worked for the government in one of our engineering national labs, um, real time for us was measured in, in actual microseconds. Um, in some other settings, it is seconds or minutes, um, and in others, it's milliseconds, nanoseconds. So let's talk about one of our healthcare um, initiatives or use cases. Um, and in 2014, at the Intel Developer Forum in San Francisco, our Senior Vice President for the Data Center Group, Diane Bryant, actually talked about one of Intel's ambitious goal to treat cancer all in one day by the year 2020. That's in five years. So here, I'm just gonna depict very quickly um, what that means in terms of real-time analytics. So being able to treat cancer or deliver precision medicine and being able to look at the, all the different pipelines and all the different um, biology, taking it from your genome to your sensors, and I'm wearing my basis watch today, 
Um, so it's taking biometric data off of me right now. And if I was to combine that with my genome and actually move that and combine that with my exposome, I'm trying to get to um, precision medicine that's very individualized to me and to you. So just looking at the genome sequencing, whole genome sequencing of one individual, it's about one terabyte of raw data. So being able to process that in near real time is actually um, taking quite a few of our Intel resources in order to get to that all in one day vision. As a matter of fact, let's just think about how hard this is. If we think about a patient visit and a, as he starts, he or she starts their journey at, um, at a doctor's clinic in, in their office um, and going from that visit to finding the genes that are causing specific disease or cancer and figuring out what key pathways, biological molecular pathways are involved. And then being able to figure out what genes um, are being targeted by the drugs that exist out in the world by our different pharmaceutical companies or which new uh, drugs have to be custom created just to target your specific genes. And then at the end of the day, you go home with peace of mind with a treatment protocol individualized and personalized just for you. This is a really complex pipeline. Um, and we actually have researchers um, and collaborations worldwide helping us move from sequencing and primary analysis, secondary analysis, um, DNA, RNA pipelines, genoty genotype and phenotype expression, eventually helping us get to a deliver uh, uh, outcome of, of precision medicine, personalized medicine, just completely focused on you and customized to you. Um, there's a lot of, of analysis that we actually have to apply at every one of these uh, levels. And today, some of these processes take one or four days, weeks, weeks, months. Um, and if it's something very rare, it's, it's actually months of research. Um, and a lot of literature um, going. So to give you an example, um, in the column two, we have a team that was able to take just one task within this step that usually took, I'm just going to skip that, about a day. So about 22 hours. And just being able to land that pipeline on uh, Hadoop infrastructure allowed us to reduce that time to two minutes. And now we're beginning to look at reducing that to seconds. So um, I'm not going to go into the details of how we did that, but here's, here's the, the obligatory rectangles within rectangles that show our uses of Hadoop. And actually, this was based on, on a Cloudera distribution of Hadoop. So let's talk about other cases. Back to Radhika. All right. OK, so you can hear me. Thank you, Monica. So Monica just talked about how real is real time. And that's actually relative. Uh, what's real time for healthcare may not be what's real time for you when you're standing at a checkout counter expecting something to happen. Um, so I'm going to share two use cases that are so tangential to what she talked about. Let's take social media. Anyone use social media here? Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you know what YouTube is? I'm sure you've heard of it. All right, I'm not going to talk to you about what YouTube does in the back end, but I'm going to talk about something that sounds so similar. Yuko. I did not make it up. Yuko is actually the number one video sharing website in China, and um, they have uh, some amazing stats. Pretty much the experience that you would get on Yuko is similar to what you would get on YouTube over here. Um, I'm going to show you what their volume was, what kind of data volume that they were dealing with. Uh, there is actually a wonderful white paper that's written on this exact use case. So if you found, find this interesting, I would suggest you go back, Google, and read that white paper as well, because it's so much to learn from there. Um, but once you see this volume, you have a newfound respect for what these social media websites are going through day in, day out. When we stand there submitting something and it's just doing this whole loading, loading, and you get so anxious and so frustrated, 
So I'm going to show you what exactly it takes to make that near real-time experience happen for you. Uh, 200 million daily views. They have about 200 million video uploads on an everyday basis as well. Uh, 200 terabytes of data and uh, 10 trillion records daily. Um, their expectation or what their users expect from them is less than four milliseconds, four microseconds. Yeah, probably it's a little more. So they have this amazing, complicated big data infrastructure with a whole lot of specific use cases and applications nested within it that powers up this experience for the users. It was all implemented on Hive MapReduce. So let's talk about our experience with typical uh, websites like this. Uh, you go in there, you let's say your kid, model. my kid loves Disney animation, so I watch a set of Disney animation movies. The next time I log into YouTube, I want YouTube to be sensible enough to not say, recommend that since I watch all these Disney animations, it thinks I might enjoy a bunch of horror clips. I don't want that. I'm gonna think, be sensible about it, come on. I watched a lot of fun movies, you're gonna recommend something that you think I would like. So it's a recommendation part. We've all been um, spoiled to expect our computers to know us, to understand us and experience, give us a better experience. We expect our apps to do that. And a lot of these apps are built around providing that experience for us. Uh, so user interest prediction with a high degree of accuracy, with low, with high relevance is very important. And that's a challenge not just for Yuko, it's a challenge for a lot of these social media sites that are trying to give you that personalized experience. Um, low relevance, low prediction. High relevance, more accurate prediction. No horror clips. Iterative computing. If you go to these websites, um, you go look for, let's say, a cake baking recipe a video. Uh, it comes up with a few suggestions on related baking video tutorials. So it understands the relationship between the videos so it can categorize them accordingly. So there's a lot of interest that these companies have in actually identifying the video relationship as users upload. So two specific use cases. So the, for the video relationship upload, and we said they had 200 million daily uploads on their site. For 200 million daily uploads, guess how many video relationships they have established? One billion video relationships to categorize it. Now that's going to involve quite a bit of iterative computing. And Spark is actually a great fit for something that involves iterative computing. Um, so this iterative computing actually lever leverages a lot of machine learning as well as graph computation algorithms. With graph computation, it uses some kind of a clustering algorithm to define what the video relationship is between the, what based on what the user is watching. It used to take them 80 minutes to identify the video relationship based on the uploads, 80 minutes on an everyday basis. Um, that wasn't good enough for Yuku. Um, as a consumer, as a user of this website, all you care about is I, I look, I search for this is, this, is this appearing? Are the relevant related videos appearing? Um, and I'm explaining this iterative computing in the background because we understand all of this is powering, ultimately powering the end user experience for you. It's all the behind the scenes work for you ultimately. Um, they came to our, our team um, uh, in software, uh, in uh, PRC, and uh, they were using Xeon servers, powering up their big data infrastructure. They wanted to see if we could optimize anything on Hive MapReduce. They thought, well, Spark might be a good candidate for this. So we recommended a Spark Shark infrastructure for this. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. We won't go into the specific ETL blocks, but Monica pointed out, we all love these block diagrams, so let's put it out there. Um, so just moving to Spark Shark, they were able to bring down the iterative computing time from 80 minutes down to five minutes. That was pretty big. And by implementing Spark Shark, now I'm gonna say, the user interest prediction aspect that I talked about, to be able to do that, they had an in-house uh, developed algorithm, an NBS computation model, um, which, ha which, had a two, which predicted a two degree uh, relevance, order of relevance. With this implementation, they were able to bump up the prediction by an order of magnitude, which means the next time you go to Yuku, you're probably going to see a more, more accurate prediction of what you might like. Um, a lot of companies in the video sharing business, streaming business, that end up plea wanting to please you are going to use some variation of this algorithm. Um, so uh, just with a uh, high map reduces spark shark gave them this tremendous uh, improvement. I wasn't good enough. For that prediction, it took them 40 hours to do the computation. 
So they said, well, what else can we do? Uh, we have the best uh, IA working, we have the latest uh, uh, technology working. Well, there was something else uh, we had up our sleeve that we said, well, let's try it out. I don't know how many of you have heard about this. This is Intel's Math Kernel Library. It's Intel's, it's referred to as Intel MKL. Intel Math Kernel Library includes highly vectorized, threaded set of linear algebraic, fast Fourier transformations, and uh, statistic computing. Um, so it's a rich set of algorithms that are optimized to run so fast. So we said, well, let's try your computations that you were doing by leveraging Intel MKL. Um, that actually did a final trick for them, 40 hours down to three hours. So it's a series of things that we tried out um, that brings you the near real-time experience. Once again, it's a relative near real-time experience that you would expect from any of these social media websites. Uh, I do not know what YouTube is using or what uh, Facebook is using. Everyone has their proprietary version of doing something similar. But the point is, uh, there is a multitude of things you can use by leveraging a lot of the open source stuff by actually getting you closer to the experience that you want. Um, I'm gonna share one more story, security, in the security space. Uh, video analytics. Video analytics is becoming increasingly popular and it's pretty much changing the face of the security industry. Um, but there's nothing, in security, video analytics itself is not a groundbreaking concept because I mean, anywhere you walk, you see a bunch of cameras pointing at you. There's not a single place you can go to anymore that doesn't capture a video of you. But the traditional video analytics implementation are not just expensive and proprietary, but they also are just looking at what's happening now. I'm interested in the current real-time motion detection. But to do that, they end up collecting tons of data. All that video streams that come from the multiple camera feeds still end up getting stored somewhere. Just they, they just end up going unanalyzed. So there's a huge opportunity for us to take this lot of unstructured image and data and act actually convert them into structured insights. Um, and that's a perfect big data problem for us. Um, well, that said, it's not such an easy job to implement any video analytics solutions. I want to put that out front in case you think walking out of this room, all right, we saw something, I'm going to go develop a video analytics app. Well, it's not that straightforward, so you have a lot of things that you have to take into consideration. Any video analytics app, uh, transcoding, how are you going to take that MPEG and break it down into meaningful image frames and send it across the wire without actually bogging down the bandwidth. But you're still able to send reliable data, uh, meaningful data, so you can actually get some processing done in the back end and get some analytics out of it. Um, correlation, let's say, uh, well, let's talk about algorithms. Well, just the algorithms that you would need for doing face recognition and face detection can be a little bit complicated. Let's say you get past all that and you get all your structured insights out of it, and you want to actually cr cross correlate this with what happened at, at, at the same time, but with a different data source, a different transaction log. So how can you do the cross correlation? Things that you would want to actually take into consideration for you to develop a meaningful, insightful video analytics application. And then we go back to our traditional real time or near real time. So uh, the example I'm gonna show here, um, I, I'm not at liberty to share a whole lot of details because there are three customer use cases that are getting actually productized based on this um, high level framework. But I will tell you, a uh, few months from now, come to our IDF, Intel Developer Forum, come to our few other events, we will give you a deep dive on what exactly the workloads were, what were the actual performance results you saw out of it. Um, but the concept itself is very, sim very simple. You get a bunch of uh, video feeds coming in from your smart camera, and actually that gets uh, there is a, there's a bit of edge processing that we end up doing so that we don't end up sending repetitive frames back to the uh, cloud. Um, you always have to do some kind of edge processing, otherwise you're gonna bring down your network. So it feeds into your Kafka. Kafka here acts as both as a producer as well as a consumer. Kafka feeds it to the Spark streaming driver running on co uh, Spark code, and that actually is able to do both the face detection and face recognition. The face detection and face recognition SDK is something that our Intel labs developed uh, you have a variety of algorithms available in the market today, even some open source versions of what you can do. What makes the difference is how much accuracy you can get. Am I gonna get a 70% accuracy, 75% accuracy in terms of my hit rate with my face recognition? That's what makes the difference. Uh, what, so once it does a face detection, it actually looks for a target image frame. So let's say you are doing this, you are, you are enabling this in a subway surveillance, and um, you're, the authorities are interested in figuring out if there's a criminal who's out on the loose in the subway. 
you can actually upload in the front through the user interface the targeted uh, image and then you can actually capture the image from all the incoming video streams from the different subway cameras and you will be able to do a real time match and the spark streaming driver once it finds the match it actually sends an alert back to your query interface uh, we actually did a demo of this um, at the Strata Hadoop uh, conference in February and uh, this concept doesn't have to be just in security it can be extended to retail it can be extended to transportation interestingly enough we had someone from um, insurance company actually come in and talk to me and said well wait a minute i think this would be a good use case for us in the insurance liability space because we want to make sure the tired drivers are off the road we don't want them driving and the tire truck tra drivers uh, so there might be a use case we want to work uh, here uh, the current use cases we are actually enabling are in banking um, as well as in, I will say, one popular uh, movie studio that's based off LA, big years. I just won't tell the name, so you do the guess. Uh, so uh, exciting stuff happening. And we are seeing a trend, an uptick. Uh, Real-time analytics is happening now. Exciting use cases that are emerging, um, which is all a wonderful trend, uh, because all this means the camp is getting bigger. Uh, Remember, I said BDA, big data analytics applications. Well, that this is a lot of it is BDA, and actually, even as I looked at the agenda for this conference, there's a lot of wonderful use cases that are getting shared today by some of these companies. But this alone is just not enough. Um, I, I read this Gartner research report that just came out this week, and I'm pretty much in agreement with it. Uh, that all right, Hadoop is moving, uh, just not fast enough, and. I think from our experience, we see the same thing. You saw what we enabled in those three use cases, but you did not know what went behind the scenes to enable that. It takes a little more than an army of people to do that. And that's not a scalable model. While all of these contributions are great work for the open source, we need more such contributions coming and hitting the open source, more end-to-end -end recipes being built. Um, so our takeaway and call to action, and if you are a business guy, you obviously know what this is. This is a standard technology adoption uh, curve, bell curve. Now overlay it with uh, the business author, Jeffrey Moore's uh, Need to Cross the Chasm. We believe big data and BDA actually is, has reached the problem of needing to cross, cross the chasm. Uh, the Gartner report, of course, is very optimistic and it says that, well, they are already at the threshold of moving from early adopters to early majority. Well, it depends on who you're talking to. It's good if you're already getting there, but it's just not moving fast enough. Put things in perspective. The number of apps that are out in the cloud, million apps. Apply the BDA filter on it, you're looking at a few hundreds. The BDA app ecosystem has sort of become a, a hand-tooled uh, way of putting out apps that a few ISPs are working on. If this needs to get mainstream, few things we need to work on. Um, these are the big pain points. Um, we see this across Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark. Uh, this is based on our use cases. This is based on what we are hearing in the community. Serious pain point, integration. Okay, there's a bunch of things. How the heck do you make all of them work together? Can we actually make integration features that will seem a little more seamless? Um, be for examples and end-to-end -end recipes. Uh, a new company that's trying in to create a product or an idea needs to be focused on just their product idea. They shouldn't have to worry about the middleware and the optimization and how do I stitch this, how do I make that work, um, how do I do the resource utilization, what kind of a reference architecture do I need to have? Well, leave that all to us. We should be able to do it. And uh, we are doing a lot of stuff in defining some of these baseline architectures, defining end-to-end -end recipes across the different verticals. Um, but we just show what is possible. And we're hoping that we're providing the right kind of building blocks that kind of seeds the thoughts for a lot of people like you to take it further and make it more mainstream. Uh, Richard scalable algorithms, a uh, wonderful set of algorithms in MLLib. If you ask in Spark, my team works on Spark analytics, but if you want to take that and actually extend it to internet scale applications, that's, that's another beast you need to handle and the richer set of capabilities. So there's always, there is a need for us to actually build uh, Build, make this camp be bigger, make it more appealing. Don't make this appealing and frightening such that only power developers are able to start developing BDA apps. We need to bring in the data scientists, the SQL developers, the data analysts, so give them the right kind of tools. So from the high level language layer contributions all the way down to the infrastructure components optimization, uh, there's plenty of work that needs to happen. Uh, we just showed what is possible and we just ended up telling you stories because at the end of the day, what you remember is just a story. 
you can always go back to the slide deck and you can pull out that architecture diagram. Um, so that's why we didn't spend so much time on the block diagrams as such. You would get it out of any book anyway, as well as our white papers. Um, collaborate with us. We have some exciting projects. Because a lot of our projects that are already part of the Apache Hadoop or Spark, you can get it from there. But we use our software.intel.com slash big data as sort of a landing zone for some of the new stuff uh, that's not reach the main branch. So check it out or grab one of us, talk to us on any of these projects or anything else that piques your interest and uh, uh, we'll chat more on that. All right, uh, I have to say this, we have some exciting stuff going on. Um, you wanna know more about what we are doing in Spark, go check out our booth. Uh, we have some uh, good demos there. We have some uh, um, stuff on our um, Discovery Peak over there. As well as we have two exciting talks. Uh, Intel, is, uh, Intel is huge. So there are different parts of Intel and all of us are working on big data. Uh, there's some excellent lessons from our IT team uh, in implementing big data at Intel just to power Intel. Intel's data center. So come listen to those talks and obviously uh, empowering Hive with Spark. I know Chen Chen, he's a committer on uh, Hive, so if you want, he's a go-to expert. So definitely stay connected. All right, I guess that leaves four minutes on the table. Questions?